Thank you. The thing about being brave is that while you're doing it, it doesn't necessarily feel that good. In fact, sometimes it can feel like you're being a bit stupid. And if, if a success is someone who's failed lots of times and got up again, then being comfortable with the possibility of things not going right is a really important part of being brave. But sometimes it really does, after the fact, just feel like a huge mistake. Sometimes it can be very difficult to put your finger on that moment when a candidate puts themselves in the firing. But no, no, for you it was right here. So here's a curveball I'm going to send you right now. <laughs> Ladies, who's going to be the project manager on this task? I am. I'd volunteered. I'd volunteered. Very brave. Very brave indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I assumed I would win The Apprentice, which is why I went on. I had a great idea for no child leaving primary school without the ability to read, write and spell. I'm an educator. It was worth being away from my three kids for eight weeks. I wrote them a letter to open every single day while I was away. Inside the letter, I put a photo of me and them, a different photo for every child for every day. That's 168 letters. It took me 12 hours and I was back in three days. <laughs> I got back and I said to my husband, oh, God, I'm going to have to fake my own death. And Ed's like, yeah, OK, give it a few days. But it's just really interesting because, the, and actually, The Apprentice was meant to be my big comeback. 20 years before The Apprentice, I was on blind date. <laughs> I know, I'm a glutton for it. And I was a picker. My date was John from Leeds. And he left me in a romantic restaurant, climbed out of the window and went for McDonald's. <laughs> And the only reason I know that is because when I started teaching, I was teaching five and six year olds and we do this lovely thing called circle time where they all come in and share something. And one of the kids went, miss, I saw you get dumped on telly. <laughs> and I was like, yes, thank you, Kirk. And, uh, and he said, miss, it's all right. My dad says he wouldn't say no. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, oh my God. Actually, which one is your dad? Sorry. <laughs> The thing about bravery is that it doesn't feel like bravery when you're doing it. And it's, it, what we need to do is get out of our own way. It's not about us. You know, we do this as leaders. We think, oh, I've got to be brave. It's not about us. Leadership isn't about being brilliant. It's about making other people brilliant. And that's what I want to tell you about Mrs. Cook. She was my teacher when I was in year one. And she was having a really bad day <laughs> when I showed my husband this photo. He said, oh, is that you on the back row in the middle next to the Michael Jackson look-alike? <laughs> and I said, no, love, I am the Michael Jackson look-alike. <laughs> so that's me with the, the afro there. What a killer. Good-looking kid, eh? So Mrs Cook, th there was this one that Mrs Cook's being observed, a performance review, like, in action. So she's in there, being and this class, you can tell from looking at us, a bunch of ragtags. I mean, we couldn't focus, we couldn't concentrate. And to top it all off, it's the eye test today. So someone comes in and gives her a note saying, everyone's got to go for an eye test. And Mrs Cook's like, well, why not? Because we live in chaos anyway. So anyway, she announces this eye test and I go completely ape and I jump up, scream, pick a chair up, throw it across the room and run out and lock myself in the toilet. Because Karen Summers, front row, stupid smile, told me that when you have an eye test, they poke your eye out with your finger, they put it in your mouth, and then they spit it out and stick it back in your head. I was terrified. <laughs> and without the emotional literacy to say, excuse me, Mrs Cook, I'm slightly perturbed about the forthcoming eye test. <laughs> All I had was fear and anguish, and I ran. Now, Mrs Cook being observed at that point could have, could have told me off. She could have had a go. She could have taken control as the leader. But she came and sat in the cubicle next to me. And she probably wanted to have a little cry herself, know how bad it was going. And she talked to me about my successes. She talked to me about a story I wrote, a reading test I took. And she, she said to me, I'm going to wait here until you're brave enough to come out of that cubicle. And I, by now, I'm like, I'm the little, my afro's all in the mouth. I've got snot everywhere. I'm just, uh, and I open the door, and she's standing outside the door with her arms like this and her head on one side, just smiling. And I run up to this woman and wrap my arms around her. That was the first time I remember being brave. 
Mrs. Cook is the reason I went into education in the first place. We used to do a, who are you going to be when you grow up? And she asked us, and this guy in the middle, the one with the dodgy eye and the big collars, that's Graham. The, she asked us, what are you going to be? And Graham said, I want to be a daddy. And we're like, you idiot, you don't get paid for being a daddy. <laughs> but I, I actually, I did, <laughs> I spoke, I speak now at conferences and I spoke at the Elbow Hall. Graham's sister was in the audience and told me that Graham went on to have eight different kids by six different women. <laughs> <laughs> Dreams do come true, people. <laughs> Graham is living proof. <laughs> So anyway, she got to me and I'm like, oh my God, Mrs. Cook's talking to me because I idolise this woman. She like that outfit she's got on there. She wore that every day, always brown, like the wrong shade of brown every day. Long sleeves, long smock to the ankles, brown hair, brown everything. And she turned to me and said, what are you going to do? Who are you going to be when you grow up? And I'm like, <laughs> she's talking to me. And I said, I want to be just like you. And she said, do you mean you want to be a teacher? And I'm like, I, I, I don't know, are brown people allowed to be teachers? I've never seen one. I'm like, yeah, sure, whatever. And she said, you should definitely do that. You would make a phenomenal teacher. It's going to take an incredible amount of work, but you'd be great. And it's like she put a stake in the ground that was my future and tied a piece of elastic around me in the next 20 years or me being drawn towards this stake. And, and she was right. It did take a lot of work and I did have to be very brave because after this photo was taken, we moved and I lived with my mum and she went on to have five more brothers and we lived with her stepdad who was really not a great guy. He was torturous and we were neglected and beaten. It was, it was a horrible place to live. But I never forgot the impact of Mrs Cook. Fast forward to me being 11 years old. I'm standing in a changing room holding a dress. And I got there because this was my family at 11. This was my life. Um, my parents would be out on the streets all the time. So I'd be responsible for my younger brothers and sisters. And we would just try and stay out of trouble. But we're in the red light area. So that was quite hard. Got very good at negotiating with drug dealers and pimps and staying out of the way of things that look dangerous. And that's what was happening at home. That was my authentic life. But at school, this is what you saw. This was the kid with the borrowed blazer because this day was photo day in school and I didn't have a blazer. And so Caroline Myers, my mate, lent me some ribbons for my hair. And when I walked into the room where the photos were being taken, there was a pile of blazers there. And I thought, oh my gosh, I am going to get one of those woolen blazers. I am going to fit in. I'm going to blend. It's going to be great. And they handed me a blazer and I sat down and I smiled that smile like, check me out. And I had my photo taken and then they took the blazer away from me. Because for this school, it wasn't about being authentic. It was about looking right. And I passed the test. A week after this photo was taken, it was the sex ed slash period talk. If you want to be brave, you need to talk about periods with 11-year-old girls. That's what bravery looks like. And uh, all my friends, oh, it was the worst teacher could do it. Mrs. Gautry, the one with the lisp, the PE teacher. And she's talking. And of course, every time she says penis, everybody starts laughing. <laughs> oh, it's a terrible lesson. It's a terrible lesson. And I'm sitting with my friends and I'm watching this cartoon video and this is going on. And as I'm watching the video and they start explaining about sex and pregnancy, suddenly my throat freezes like ice. And I watch this video and I realize at 11 years old that what my stepdad has been forcing me to do for the past five years is how you get pregnant. And I just break. I mean, I die inside. And I, I look around the gym at my friends, and I'm looking for someone else. Is there, so, who else is, but there's no one. And I'm on my own. I'm with no one to turn to and no one to stand with. I, I, I run out of the gym and I'm sick in the toilet and I make a decision that I have to go. And I run away. I run away from home. I'm on the streets for three days. Three days and nights I'm on the streets. And I know how to look after myself. We spend a lot of time on the streets. But after three days, I meet a phenomenally authentic man, an incredible human being called Jason. Jason knew how to <laughs> enroll someone. He, he said, what, what are you doing? It's, it's cold. You shouldn't be here. He gave me his coat. He gave me, bought me food because I was hungry. He looked after me. He even let me stay at his house 
And that's how I find myself at 11 years old, standing in a changing room, holding a dress. Only it's not a dress, it's lingerie. And Jason isn't a kind benefactor, he's a pimp. They know how to enrol people. And in this changing room, with that dress, I don't know the word for like prostitution, but I know I'm in danger. I've been missing three days, no one's looking for me. School is long gone, they don't even know that I'm not there. I am on my own, and I'm like a phone when you get off in a foreign country, when your phone tries to find a signal, and I'm, I'm looking at people in the changing room thinking, is, can anyone, wait? but I, there's no one. There is no one. And in that moment, while I'm standing in that changing room, holding that dress, one clear thought comes into my mind. Oh my God, Mrs. Cook would not wear this outfit. <laughs> it's bonkers, I haven't seen Mrs. Cook for seven years. I've got no idea what she's doing, where she is, but it's like my brain is scanning for a decent human and finds this one and thinks she wouldn't wear it, but it was enough. I dropped the outfit. I run out of that changing room, plus Jason, he's not used to like escapees, he's rolling a joint, leaning on some bras, and I go straight across the road to the police station, which I knew well, because I've been in and out of foster care several times by now. And I got into the police station and I put my hands on the counter and said, I demand the right to remain silent. <laughs> because I thought that's what you did. <laughs> and the guy was like, yeah, okay, sure. I mean, I knew that going into foster care wasn't gonna be like a Cinderella happy ever ending. I, I've been in and out enough times to know that wasn't gonna happen. But in, it didn't matter, because in that moment, I committed an act of bravery that would make Mrs. Cook proud. And that's why bravery is worth it, because it is not about you. Bravery is contagious. Bravery is catching. Bravery goes on to grow, and you need discomfort to grow. You can't grow from a position of, oh, everything's fine, I'm doing great, I don't really worry about mistakes. You, you can't grow from that. Mrs. Cook and four other teachers like her, which I mentioned in my book available on Amazon, is <laughs> the reason that this is what my life looks like now. I'm married to a guy who's got the best bum north of Watford. <laughs> I have three amazing kids. Our, our family motto is team and parfait, adding value, bringing joy. So if we go to a restaurant, we get a snotty waiter. Trinity's like, oh, we're gonna add value and bring joy to this guy's life, aren't we? I'm like, yes, we are. And she she, when he comes over, she'll say, have you always wanted to be a waiter or did you want to go to university? I mean, I'm going to university, but waiting's fine too, if that's what you want. And the guy's like, why is this kid talking to me? And then Jacob, my middle son, he, he knows a lot of jokes about cheese. I'm a bit worried about him, if I'm honest. And he'll go into this routine of cheese jokes. But my secret weapon is Leo. He's just turned six. And he knows that if you're polite to adults, they are putty in your hands. So when the guy comes over to take the orders or bring the starters, Leo's like, hey, thank you for coming. Nice tie. And before, we've never got to a main course without waiters loving us, ever. Because value on its own is great. But... Joy on its own is fun, but both. Adding value and bringing joy. That's what happens when you inspire someone else to make a difference. When you inspire someone else to believe that they can be more than they think they are. I shouldn't be here. I should be dead or in prison or, I don't know, on a psych ward or, or a prostitute. And, you know, I'd do quite well. I might have achieved all those if I'd committed to it. But the reason I'm not is because... Somebody else took a step of bravery and that I was lucky enough for that to happen several times throughout my time. So even though I was going through court cases and it was hideous, I managed to do A-levels and I failed my A-levels. I got two E's and I, I phoned the first, I went through clearing and I phoned the first place and it was Aberystwyth University. I couldn't understand what they were saying, so I put the phone down <laughs> and then I phoned the next place. <laughs> And it was like Aberdeen University. And I said, oh, hello, I've got two E's. And she said, two E's, that's amazing. Come for an interview. And I was like, oh, no, no, two E's. And she went, oh, no, and put the phone down. And I thought, you know what? The only thing standing between me and my dream that Mrs. Cook planted for me is the fact that I was born the wrong side of the Scottish border, easily remedied. So I skipped to B, picked up the phone. Hello, my name's Jazz. I got two E's come along for an interview. Because E sounds a bit like A, if you're Scottish. 
And I remember putting the phone down and thinking, that wasn't bravery, that was pure stupidity. How are you going to be Scottish for the next four years? How are you going to, what are you going to do with your certificates? And I went for the interview. And I remember walking in and the guy's got blonde hair, looks like a horse had been eating it, it, it very scruffy. <laughs> And, and he said, and I thought, you know, brush your hair. for And he said, oh, you're from this estate in Nottingham. I, you know, this estate. My cousin used to work there. He's a youth worker. No one leaves that estate. Girls don't finish school. They get pregnant at 12, and then they, they don't finish school. How are you here? And I said, let me tell you a story. And I told him about Mrs. Cook and Mr. Williams and Mr. Simpson and Miss Archer and Mr. Redmond. And I told him about these five people who encouraged me to be just a tiny bit braver than I thought was possible. And at the end, I said, by the way, I got two E's, not two A's. Is that OK? And he said, if you promise to be more authentic, I promise to get you a place in this teacher training college. And I didn't know what authentic was, so I said yes and then looked it up afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> authenticity is the secret to bravery. But authenticity sucks because on the flip side of authenticity is vulnerability. If you have authenticity without vulnerability, you have like, you know, Donald Trump, completely authentic, no vulnerability whatsoever. I mean, he's a great guy, I'm sure. We just don't see it. But authenticity <laughs> requires us to be vulnerable, and vulnerability hurts. But if you want a team who rally around, if you want a team who are brave enough to speak up, then we have to encourage, we have to be authentic, like these three were here. How amazing is that to hear from leaders saying, these are the mistakes I've made? So here's a present for you. Get your phones out. I know some of you are millennials. Don't sit there going, oh, I don't have a phone. Yes, you do. <laughs> This is, uh, this is what bravery looks like. This is what brave, courageous leadership looks like. These are statements that I have said to my teams, that I've had them say to me. If you go to that site, you can just go and download it. Um, use it. Say these things to people. Be vulnerable yourself. Be authentic yourself. It's about being human first. We're talking about roles and names and titles. We're humans first. And that connection is what encourages people to step outside where they think they could be. Thank you for what you do. Take ownership of the fact that when you connect with people in a real way, you are actually changing people's lives. You're not making plastic bricks or being head of a game that's played with an inflatable pig's bladder. You are actually changing people's lives because what happens at work grows bigger when people leave. The impact you have isn't what happens when you're in the room. It's what happens when you haven't been in that room for seven years. So thank you very much for listening and please be 2% braver.